Institutions and our publisher, Sage, we right away offered research and hands-on pedagogical resources to help faculty, uh, many of us thrown into this on online world. And the board quickly realized that this conference couldn't be the same. And, and I think we, we looked out in the marketplace and realized that a lot of conference organizations um, were holding out hope. And we decided that we had to quickly communicate with all of you and, and, and really assess the situation and act. Um, and so with the help of our um, conference team and our sponsoring university, and really honestly, um, sadness in all of us, uh, we decided to move to this, to this space. And between March and now, um, I, I think, um, I think we brought to life the spirit of MOBTS. And I think that speaks to the commitment of Brandon, and the board and, and, and all of you um, as well. I'm, I'm really been all in all this week, the sessions have been engaging, they've been thoughtful, they've been heartwarming, they've been fun. Um, and I, you know, obviously, and many of us talked about this through the last couple of days, we haven't been able to replicate uh, late night dorm conversations or the random, you know, chats in the hallways in between sessions, I think the technology that we've leveraged has filled a void that we would have otherwise had if, if we chose to cancel. So hopefully you share in that gratitude, um, at least that I, that I have. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to, to Steve Edelson of Walsh University, who's our treasurer and Brandon, our executive director, and they're gonna provide an overview of the financial state of MOBTS, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in a bit. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, hopefully that number is fairly small. Uh, I try to make myself seen around the conference uh, every year. Um, look forward to seeing many of you at our virtual talent show, Jim's Place, tomorrow evening. If you haven't signed up yet, do so. Uh, but my report today is not on talent. It is on um, our finances, the treasurer's report. So uh, I'll jump into it. Uh, generally speaking, big picture, right? The summary, if you're, if you're looking for the TLDR of this, we're in good financial health. Uh, our conference revenues are down, as you might expect, uh, but the expenses are down commensurately. We've gone to the virtual model and that has you know, shrunk our costs greatly, um, especially with Brandon doing yeoman's work uh, to keep uh, this conference up and running. And you know, if you've seen his mission control, uh, with six screens on at once to make sure that the Zoom sessions uh, run smoothly. When it comes to our investment portfolio, uh, we are down slightly. Uh, most of the market has uh, returned, and I've got another slide for that, but um, whenever the market does well, we do well, but not quite as well. And whenever the market goes down, we go down, but not quite as far. We're in a very, uh, we have a conservative investment portfolio intentionally. Uh, so overall, um, you know, other than the portfolio performance, we project to have approximately the same bottom line uh, operating surplus that we would have normally, more or less. Uh, so I'll look at a couple of items here uh, that I did want to highlight um, that are just, uh, we for the first time, 2020 was our first year that we've had uh, a fairly uh, significantly, I don't want to say realistic, but a meaningful budget uh, that the finance committee and the board took very seriously in developing and tried to really nail those numbers down as much as possible. And so when it comes to our conference revenues, yeah, those are down, you know, nearly a hundred thousand dollars because uh, we have a significantly lower uh, registration fee for the virtual conference than we would for a traditional conference. Our investment portfolio is down. And again, I have a more detailed slide for that coming up. Um, we did have, more revenues coming in both from our royalties from Sage, which is a testament to the great work that our uh, journal editors have done, uh, marshalling our journals. Uh, and so our royalties are up um, even beyond what we had budgeted for. And then when it comes to expenses, our expenses for this conference are, are significantly lower. Um, and then our June board meeting, which we usually have in person prior to the conference, obviously we held that virtually on Zoom and that saved the organization uh, some money as well as um, not because the Academy of Management, oh, pardon me, I'm gonna click incorrectly here. Uh, because Academy of Management is not happening in person, we don't have an attendance and reception that we usually contribute to uh, with MED. Uh, our expenses for the international conference were slightly lower than expected as well. 
uh, and our pre-conference expenses for the DI and EEI uh, were also uh, you know, down because, of course, we did those virtually. Uh, and a big shout out to our DI and EEI facilitators for making that work uh, on this past you know, Friday, uh, Friday and Saturday, I believe. So when it comes to our portfolio, uh, year to date, as of two days ago, uh, we'd lost just over $40,000 uh, in our portfolio, which represents a year-to-year -year loss from June 28th uh, of 2019 to June 29th of this year, a year and a day, 2.58%. Um, By comparison, the Dow Jones index is down 3.78% in that same time period. We have, as a board and as a finance committee, taken some actions to um, be aware of these you know, financial challenges that we're facing and the pandemic and the impact that that's having um, on all organizations, the impact that's having on all of you uh, when it comes to many of you having your research budgets uh, being cut, travel budgets being cut. Um, we've already preemptively made the decision uh, for our scheduled fall board meeting in October uh, not to meet in person. Uh, and that will save us approximately $20,000 uh, we've also in the past year uh, enlisted a CPA firm to aid in bookkeeping and also to give us a best a review, an, a, an accounting review, if you will, not an audit per se, but a review of what we do uh, to help us develop best practices. And some of the things they've done, uh, they've created a more detailed chart of accounts for us that just helps for when I am sorting, you know, sending out checks, uh, cashing checks from or, or bringing in uh, income from various organizations. Uh, they also, you know, by being hooked in and hooked into our uh, QuickBooks account, this bookkeeping firm also will send me an email once a week if something doesn't make sense. Like this withdrawal or this deposit, we can't see where it easily lines up. Can you clarify this for us? Uh, and that's just another set of eyes for us to make sure that uh, everything is going as it should with our financial uh, situation makes it a lot easier for us to communicate uh, our finances to our CPA for tax filing. We have a separate CPA uh, who handles our tax filing out of California because that is where we are registered. Uh, and the CPA firm uh, had liked some of the policies that we had developed in terms of uh, reimbursement forms and um, they've helped us also recommend some best practices for reimbursement policies uh, and when it comes to expenses. So as a final word, I do want to just put a great big debt of thanks to the Finance Committee, Kathy Lovelace, the chair who is uh, taking a position on our executive committee this year as the uh, member at large on the executive committee, Ken Mullane, Brandon and myself on the Finance Committee. Uh, we've met several times virtually uh, over the year to uh, talk about the budget, to create this budget, to work on next year's budget, to work on policies and ensure that we have all of your interests um, in mind as we make decisions for the finances of this organization. So uh, I will take some questions. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be here for the full hour. I have an EMBA class that I'm teaching uh, starting in about 15 minutes, but I'd be glad to take some questions if anyone has any. If you wanna ask them, I suppose in the chat is probably easiest and then we can address those. If not, even when I'm off, Brandon and Michael are very much capable of answering the questions you might have uh, regarding our finances. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we'll go ahead and move forward on some other items. And then, like we said, we'll, we'll open it up to any questions that you might have about any of what we're sharing with you tonight. Uh, I want to talk about um, a strategic priority that that the board has affirmed and that really has kind of guided guided much of what we're doing moving forward. Um, last June at the, um, I guess the handoff, uh, so to speak, that I shared with you a vision that, that many of us in the organization and, and including predecessors, um, my predecessors had, which is to bring MOBTS to more and more management educators here and abroad. And I have to give kudos to Ray Andre. I remember early on in my uh, board career. So by the time I'm done serving as president, I will have been on the board 10 years. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, but early on, um, 
when when Gary and I hosted MOBTS uh, 2013, uh, the 40th conference, um, the board was at that time talking about how can we begin to grow and share the wealth of resources of MOBTS. And, and Ray had even talked about you know, continents like Africa, um, where there's really emerging, um, emerging opportunities. And, and so that was something that stuck with me and something that has, has really, um, as, as, a, as a management educator in a public, a small public liberal arts university, and now at a medium-sized public liberal arts university, how can we further um, expand the reach of, of what we do and, and the support? I mean, we've had tremendous impact on, on members throughout the years. And, and so to that end, the board affirmed um, uh, last year a number of strategic action steps um, to begin engaging. And that included outreach to uh, various dean organizations, um, various accrediting bodies, community colleges and universities that are in proximity to host sites. Um, and we've made real intentional efforts to engage business school deans in the Southeast region, the Northwest, and those part of a public uh, liberal arts consortium called COPLAC, um, and also those in the, D in the AACSB world. Um, so in all of our communications moving forward since last year, we've been very specific and targeting of these, of these individuals and these groups. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the conference team for, for helping, and we've been able to track that progress. They've, they've reached out to 50 plus regional um, and community colleges in the Midwest, close to Purdue Fort Wayne, when we thought right, that we were going to be in, in Indiana. And it paid off 33% of our attendees for the virtual conference, more than 33% are actually from the Midwest region. So we're really excited about that. Um, the board in February, so just as a heads up to everybody, um, the board traditionally meets twice a year face to face. We now meet four times a year, uh, allegedly face to face twice. <laughs> we can talk about that moving forward, but um, we also have an August and a uh, February, January, February meeting online, uh, which I think helps in, in a variety of ways. So in February, um, the board approved two very specific measurable goals related to that strategic priority of expanding the reach. I think this is, this is important for us to have some targets um, that we're not just doing things to do them and then, oh, we think they work. Uh, so the first goal, um, and these are, these are realistic and we can reassess in a year or two years to see how we're doing, but the first goal is to achieve a 10% increase in membership between the 2020-21 academic year and 2021-22. Um, and we have some data that actually, um, since this past year to this year, even though it wasn't, the timeline wasn't part of the goal, we've seen close to 50% growth in our membership. And that includes paid individual members and conference attendees. So we had 348 members in 2019 and now 521 and maybe a little higher than that since the data uh, was shared with me. So that's, that's excellent. And we had another goal, and this is related to a little bit about what I spoke earlier regarding um, engaging specific groups and constituencies. So the second goal is we wanna grow our participation rate in MOBTS activities by these affiliated constituencies, public liberal arts institutions, Southern Business Deans Group, you know, members from those Southern Business Dean uh, universities, AACSB accrediting universities, international universities. We want to grow that rate of participation by 15% between 2020-21 and the 21-22 academic years. And that participation rate is really conference attendance? Are they engaging in pre-conference workshops? Are they reviewing and publishing in our journals? SAGE is providing us uh, affiliation information um, and the degree to which they're engaging on social media, um, which we can easily track. And so since we are still in the midst of tracking this, we have some data, um, but really we're going to have a, a clear picture on, on progress to this goal as we go through the next, uh, this next year. Um, so again, I think that will help focus us a bit um, as, as we look to um, expand the reach. A couple of other um, additional items that are related to the strategic priority um, 
uh, we have now an Oceana task force, which is led by Kevin Lowe, who's, uh, who's been on the board. He was chair of a DI. He's now um, been elected to be secretary, and we're really appreciative of his work here. We tasked him to engage colleagues in the um, Australia, New Zealand region to explore the viability of us as MOBTS setting up some sort of regular presence in that area. Um, we learned that there's tremendous energy, enthusiasm, and demand for the scholarship of teaching and learning and pedagogy um, in that region. Of course, we know that from a number of faculty in that region participating and engaging in our journals as authors, as associate editors, as, as reviewers. Uh, but we saw firsthand there is there's a void there. Uh, they don't have in that region what we have in MOBTS. And so um, uh, Kevin and, and the task force are going to do some research and, and assess the viability and report to the board on some actionable items. Um, there's another interesting um, uh, thing that we've, we've done this year, and we've actually brought this back. And those who've been uh, in the organization for a long time have, have remember the institutionally affiliate, institutional affiliate program. And this is an opportunity for universities to collaborate with MOBTS to become a sponsor to some degree where um, they are able to connect their faculty with MOBTS. I just shared a link for you all of you to take a look at if you want to share with your chairs, your deans. Um, this is essentially a sponsorship opportunity, but it's not just sponsorship from an advertising perspective. Uh, faculty from those affiliates, those institutional affiliates, have access to the conference, to become members, to have access to our journals, to attend pre-conference workshops. And we really, um, as the board, talked about how we could bring this back to life and um, incorporate this in our strategic priority and and we were ready to go and, and Brandon did a great job of putting together this website and, and presenting to the board these different um, different levels of affiliation and our hopes was that we would roll this out for the the upcoming conference at Purdue Fort Wayne and of course we all know what happened so we do have a couple of institutional affiliates Cal Poly Pomona um, which is our host for next year and UNC Asheville I knew the department chair there so that that seemed to work. Um, but anyway, uh, so more to come on that in the coming year, but please do share that with your, your academic leaders. A couple of other things, um, we've had two Zoom engagement events. We had a fireside chat with Obi-Wan Gary Stark and then an Ask Me Anything session with me and Brandon this past spring. And these were really just informal Zoom gatherings during this time when I think all of us wanted, maybe we had Zoom fatigue, but I think all of us wanted to come together as a community and see fresh, you know, see the faces we remember and have fresh conversations about our experiences and, and build community. Um, those were really, really a, a great time. So we were gonna be planning to do those again and also introduce a new event called Behind the Manuscript, uh, where we'll have, um, this will be a, a, you know, a free event, uh, another Zoom event, but it's opportunity for attendees to come and engage authors of some of what we think are the most impactful journal articles from MTR and JME. And this is great. I, I think this will be a great uh, opportunity to, to, um, for attendees to ask questions of the authors. We'll, when we advertise it, we'll make sure there's a link to the journal article and to have the authors there having a conversation with them about their experiences related to their research, related to the exercise, the resource, et cetera. So we're really excited about, about that. Lastly, um, before I uh, turn it over to Brandon to talk about some other items about conferences in, in our recent survey, I am beyond thrilled to announce a new relationship uh, with MOBTS. Uh, the board approved um, a memorandum of understanding with the University of Ceres uh, uh, Center for Management Education in, in, in the UK. And this, their University of Ceres uh, Center for Management Education is led by Christine Rivers. The CME offers uh, postdoctoral teaching certification um, for management educators. So it's really ideal for second career academics you know, new uh, PhD students, ju even junior faculty who are looking to retool or 
um, explore their teaching toolkits. Um, and this is a credentialed certification. We met with Christine um, at the International Conference in New Zealand and right away, Brandon and I, the light bulbs, you know, just kept going off as we were chatting with her. And ironically, I met her as part of the opening exercise um, in New Zealand at the conference that Sarah put together. So it was kind of serendipitous. Um, but Brandon and I have talked with her over the last several months and we brought the, to the board last week uh, a proposed M MOU um, and they've approved it. And so we've now entered into this formal relationship to explore how the two organizations to, can share resources um, how we can collaborate on content for our, our members and their, um, their um, students uh, in the program, and how could, how could we leverage MOBTS and the CME program, their platforms, our brands, to recruit new members to MOBTS from Europe, but also how can we share the certification program with our members, especially our DI students, our EI students, those sorts of things. So we're really excited about this. We don't know yet what it will officially look like. That's, that's why we have an MOU, but more is to come. And I encourage you, Brandon sent this announcement out earlier. If you wanna learn more about the Center for Management Education, their certification program, attend Christine's session uh, tomorrow morning, nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, he sent out the Zoom link for that and, and it's quite late in the evening early in the morning for christine so she couldn't be here with us uh this evening but um she and i and, and the board are just absolutely thrilled um thrilled by this new opportunity so with that i'm going to hand it over to brandon to talk about the survey talk about the conferences and uh we'll open it up brandon Thank you. Uh, we are flying through this. So uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. I'm going to go through some slides with you. And then uh, I'm going to take you through a survey that we did that hopefully you had the opportunity to respond to some really interesting results that we're going to go through. Um, then we're going to go through our upcoming conferences, our 2021, uh, our international 2022, our, our annual 2022, and 2023, our 50th anniversary. Um, when we get to the 2021, we'll hear from our, our uh, site chair, Chantal Vanesh, who's here, and our program cha chair, uh, Kathy Duncan. You may, if you haven't met Kathy around our conferences, you may remember her as the uh, site chair for 2015 at Laverne, which is by far one of my favorite experiences. So I think uh, next year is going to be fantastic. So let me get my screen up here. Okay. Everybody good with that? Okay. So just went through our, our topics for discussion there. Um, in terms of the survey results, uh, we conducted a survey in March and April. We were actually going to uh, send a survey in December and January, but things got so busy uh, with the international conference leading into New Zealand that we just, we just kind of put it on the back burner and we're very thankful we did because our survey would have been completely irrelevant by the time that COVID-19 blew up uh, here in the States and internationally. So we ended up holding it a little, a little longer. We unveiled it in, through March and April, and we ended up adding COVID-19 based questions into it to see what the impact might have been. Uh, so our primary focus for the survey ended up uh, to update our own insights into, the, into our membership in terms of location, uh, preferred locations of both our domestic and our international conferences. The content of those conferences were obviously an experiential learning conference, but memberships do change and we wanted to gauge the interest of potential pedagogical research and such. Uh, the budget impacts that our members were experiencing due to COVID-19, uh, much of which was not necessarily known yet, but, um, but uh, you know, we wanted to gauge that nonetheless and the personal changes in travel habits due to COVID-19. Um, my slides here, I will admit, they were getting a little bit long, longer than I wanted them to be. So those last two, I'm, gonna, I'm going to go over verbally, but we will go over location and content here. Um, so the annual conference uh, regional preferences, we do this every so often. Um, it pretty much comes out to be the same each time. Uh, domestic conference pre preferences were ranked on a scale from one to 100, and those were, uh, Obviously, you can see the ranking there. Northeast was at the top, and we do tend to struggle a little bit when we get to the Midwest. Um, we don't host too many conferences in the lower Midwest, but 
Uh, the Midwest in general uh, came out uh, uh, towards the bottom there. Um, thankfully, uh, we've had some very successful conferences in the Northeast. We're heading to the West Coast next year with Cal Poly Pomona. Um, arguably, our most consistently successful sites actually have been in recent years in the Southeast. But one of the pieces of data that Michael actually had not uh, gone over in some of our reach efforts and things like that, they also, the Southeast actually is our also, also our most consistent base for submitting to the conference. So it makes a little bit of sense that they would not necessarily want to stay home. Um, the board did make it a point a few years ago to do our best to do better at cycling our conference around the country. Um, we had become a very, very East Coast centric conference, occasionally dabbling in the Midwest, but really not going further than that. Um, prior to 2015 at Laverne, we had not been to the West Coast since 2007 at Pepperdine, and we have not been since. So you're talking about uh, only venturing towards the West Coast twice in what will be a 14 conference period, uh, 14 year period. Um, it's not a surprise that when we head out there, we, we struggle to, to pull in some membership and, and attendees since we are largely uh, ignoring them a lot of times. Now, there's a caveat to all that. We can only go to places that we have session proposals, I mean, host proposals to. We can't magically say we want to be in the West Coast and snap our fingers and a, and a site will pop up. So part of it is up to us to engage our membership more and find those sites that would be interested. But a lot of it also is part of the membership. If you are interested in hosting, please reach out to us. And we're going to get to that a little bit later. Um, we will have a session taking place tomorrow at 10 o'clock for anybody who wants to talk about hosting uh, the uh, a future MOBS conference. Uh, host pre preferences. Um, again, we want to gauge your membership. We have, we're a uh, sorry, a campus-based conference, um, but there were preferences for to remain on the campus, but be more situated towards a resort or vacation uh, area, a destination. 59% uh, were either extremely or very interested, and 29 somewhat interested. Um, there was an actually fairly decent amount of, of individuals that were interested in being on a resort. Uh, that's a, it's a little bit more difficult. We did want to gauge interest, but it is a little bit more difficult to keep things cost controlled on a resort. Um, so that's something that to, for us to take into consideration. And when we originally designed this, we were thinking that maybe there'd be fun to have a, a conference on a cruise ship and then COVID-19 hit and uh, that's, that's not too many people's cup of tea anymore. Um, so maybe sometime down the road we'll have some fun with something like that, but, but no time soon. We really don't foresee exiting this campus uh, atmosphere that we are so used to having anytime soon. But maybe there's a scenario where we, uh, again, pending submissions uh, from site hosts, that we situate ourselves a little bit more strategically amongst uh, areas with hotels or resorts. So for our international conference, again, a one to 100 scale, and it was very interesting from those that responded that Western and Central Europe was actually a higher preference amongst these regions than anything we had that stood out domestically. Um, we have had success. We had our 2016 conference in, at Winchester in the UK. We had a really well attended uh, 2018 conference at Manuk University just out of Dublin. Um, and then obviously we just had a very successful conference down in New Zealand uh, at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch. So it's not a surprise to see Western and Central Europe and Australia slash New Zealand rise up to the top. One thing that we've never uh, done before is had anything in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Um, something we'll, we'll, we'll look at. There actually was an opportunity potentially for an international conference down the road uh, in the Caribbean and, uh, and we will continue to, to look at that to see if, it, if there's a fit. Um, one thing that we do need to um, one thing that we do need to keep an eye on is 65% of those that responded to this question or to the international questions in general did say that if they attended the international conference they could not attend the annual conference here in the states and that's very important because when we select an international conference site and we, when we price out an international conference registration fee. We price those out to be exactly break even. We don't have any real pre-conference workshops. We don't do scholarships. We don't do anything like that. We do everything we can to keep those costs down so you can enjoy 
will, will probably turn into a vacation of some sorts. Um, so if the international site grows and it starts to pull away from the annual conference, we will start to see some issues on our, on our bottom line because the bottom line of the, the domestic conference is what drives the rest of our operations. <clears throat> So there was also a question about the celebration of the 50th anniversary, which is in 2023. Um, I do want to say that there were uh, the responses for this survey were very uh, polarizing in terms of uh, how long attendees had been part of the organization. Something along the lines of 35% of respondents had been members of this organization from one to three years, and 35% had been members for 10 plus years. So, so there was a very large gap in between. And it's safe to assume that those have, that have only been part of the organization for one to three years, or even a little bit more than that, may not necessarily embrace the potential for pomp and circumstance of a 50th anniversary that those who have been with the organization for 10 plus years have. So we do need to sift through this a little bit more. We do have every intention of celebrating our 50th anniversary. It's just a matter of how far do we go with that. Um, we're open to, that's something we're open to suggestions for. Uh, again, when we get down to the sites, that's something that we'll, uh, in terms of even where our 50th anniversary is located, um, it's something that we can, we can have a, a little bit more of a debate on. This was probably the most interesting component of the survey. Pedagogical research uh, at our conference. And it's tough to ignore. 89% um, of respondents had some favorable level of adding a pedagogical uh, component to our conference. 80% uh, of them were interested in attending paper development sessions at the conference. 68% were interested on, um, uh, actually those are two I'm attending paper development sessions at the conference. I, I merged two numbers there, I apologize, skip the third one. 59% of respondents uh, were interested in doing all of this in a pre-conference setting, not necessarily within the general conference. Um, which may assist in a divide of the cultural aspect that I know some concerns would be uh, uh, raised over. And 34% of respondents said that they would stay past Saturday. So that's normal. We don't have a lot of people that want to stay post-conference. Pre-conference is where our interest tends to be. Uh, there was little to no interest in any form of poster presentation. This is not something that we as a board have had sufficient time to digest yet. It was presented at our board meeting a week ago. Um, but it is something we're going to look into a little bit further. When you have 89% and 80% saying, yeah, we really want something like this, it is tough to ignore, but we need to be sensitive to who we are as an organization and the cultural fabric that, that we are all kind of intertwined in here. So that is something we'll definitely get back to the membership on moving forward. Okay. MOBTS 2021 at Cal Poly Pomona. Uh, it will take place June 9th through 12th, 2021. The conference chairs for Cal Poly Pomona. We have our site chair, Chantal Vanesh, and we have our program chair, Kathy Duncan. I want to give them each a couple minutes here to, uh, to give a little bit of insights in their respective areas of the conference. So Chantal, if you can give us a, a little bit of an idea of what we can expect on the site end of things for Cal Poly. Sure. Um, so for those of you who haven't had me in sessions yet, because I've kind of shamelessly been promoting our area, um, I hope that you will come to Cal Poly Pomona. Um, we have horses on campus, which I know is exciting for some people. Um, pretty palm trees. We are in Southern California, pretty close to Laverne, for those of you who've been there. Uh, we have our own vineyards, our own brewery on campus, um, and a brand new business building, but also even newer dorms. Our dorms opened up in January. So we will be staying in relatively new dorms. Um, so I'm excited to kind of show you the area. We, we are super close to to Disney and the beaches and the mountains if you like hiking. Um, there's a ton of local breweries in the area and really good restaurants as I was able to show the people, Michael and Brandon, when they came to visit um, and anybody else who wants to come into the area. 
we're going to be reaching out to really hope and encourage all of those people on the West Coast who, who want a more local conference experience to, to come on down. Um, I'm really, I've, I've been so impressed by Brandon and Michael and Gary and everybody else who helped pull off this virtual conference. I did not know how we would have the OBTC way that's now the MOBTS way um, in a virtual experience, but we've been able to do it. Um, but I'd be so happy to see everybody in person again. So I hope you'll join me on my campus next year. I am equally excited, especially to have it in uh, the backyard of the University of Laverne. And I'm excited as someone who is in that at 10 plus uh, category and later in my career to be working with someone who is in the earlier part of their career, who um, brings new ideas and wonderful energy. We're very excited about our theme, which is diversity and inclusion. And we came, uh, that theme was developed before more recent events, which have made it even more relevant. Um, so I think we're going to have a great conference. I too am so hoping it'll be an in-person conference, uh, but I think we're, uh, we have a good team working on this and it will be excellent whatever way it turns out. Thank you. Oh, I do want to mention, I was in the DI with Michael in 2005. And even though I'm older than he, I have much less uh, gray hair. Uh, I'm a Dean now. This just happened overnight. So How often are we going to have to have this Dean thing thrown at us? Ask Gordon. I think he wanted to play some sort of song for me. Um, it's going to be a long couple of years. Um, yep. <laughs> so as you can see there uh, at towards the bottom, we do have the call for papers posted. I just posted that today. So give it a look. We have a wonderful theme of diversity and inclusion. And much like, look, we all wanted to be together. We wanted to, the Purdue Fort Wayne team was amazing. Fort Wayne's an amazing city and so welcoming. Um, but it's fitting that we are embracing this virtual format when we are right now. And it's fitting that heading into next year, um, we will be embracing a theme of diversity and, and inclusion because um, you know, all you need to do is look outside, turn on the news. We, we need that more than ever. So please, um, you know, Bring friends, pitch it. Uh, I know we are we are well aware that the future is murky uh, with travel budgets and all, but we hope that uh, we hope that things change for the better and we can all cobble together what we need, um, both in confidence of travel and and finances uh, to make our way out to a beautiful campus. Chantel and Kathy, thank you very much. Um, can't wait to start working with you both on this uh, starting tomorrow evening. Be ready. So moving on, we have an international 2022 site. Uh, we are heading to DHBW Mannheim, Mannheim, Germany, which beautifully fits in with the preference from our, our survey uh, of Central and Western Germany. Um, Mannheim, if you're not familiar with it, is uh, just outside of Frankfurt. Frankfurt is, uh, I believe, I believe now, at least it was a couple of years ago, uh, both the cheapest and the uh, busiest uh, continental Europe airport. Um, you, you can land in Frankfurt, you can hop on a train, and Mannheim's only about 40 minutes away from there. Um, it, it, in terms of a transportation hub, it's very centrally located. Uh, the trains all run through there. Um, so you can pre-conference, post-conference, you can travel just about anywhere you want from Mannheim. So to give you a little bit of uh, insight into the team, Andrea Honel, uh, she is with uh, MED. Um, she came to us last year at AOM, very excited. Um, she, was, she, was very, she was pushed, uh, strongly recommended to, to uh, work with us on this by Volker Runchagen, who is the finance chair at MED. Uh, Volker has, has long wanted to get our international conference into Germany. He didn't care how or where it was, but he knew that Germany needed this. Um, so we have uh, his support up in Hamburg as well. Uh, but Andrea has been phenomenal. She joined us with our call on the board meeting the other night. Uh, she's very excited about the prospects of this. Um, the dates currently, uh, the, the dates from the proposal are June 18th to 20th. We have pulled off a close proximity conference like that before we did in 2018, 
jumping from coastal to Maynooth. However, those dates are subject to change and it will probably uh, be a week later than that. Um, uh, Mannheim is very open to whatever dates we want to choose. Uh, they're uh, just looking to embrace our conference and everything we have to offer. Uh, and then we have Robert Lotto, who I've worked very much with so far, other than some email communications. Uh, but they will, but uh, but Andrea, Robert, and Volker will be uh, comprising the conference team, with Andrea being the lead. And then with MOBTS 2022 and 2023, um, we did receive some proposals for 2022 and 2023. Uh, the uh, Bruce Bruce uh, in the chat asked the 2021 dates again. That's June 9th through 12th, Bruce. Um, for 2022 and 2023, uh, Michael and I were slated to, to visit a few sites immediately after our conference in New Zealand. And then obviously COVID-19 happened and neither one of us were comfortable moving forward with that. Um, COVID-19 in the United States obviously started most heavily in Washington and that's where a couple of our, session, uh, a couple of our proposals were, were stemming from. So we put a pause on that. Uh, we also had a 2022 proposal in hand that was a rollover from 2021. Um, but given that that process has not really started yet, and we're kind of starting all over with all those sites since budgets and interests may have changed, uh, we are open to additional 2022 site proposals. Uh, in terms of 2023, we only have one potential site that has said uh, they were open to 2022 or 2023. Um, but uh, generally speaking, we're, we're still looking for competitive sites. I have set up a session in the conference program uh, for a discussion on conference hosting. Even if you just want to come by and, hey, what does it take to host a conference? Maybe not even for us. I'm willing to talk about that. But preferably somebody out there in this room or somebody that you know will be interested in hosting our conference in 2022 or 23. And you'll come by at 10 a.m. on Thursday. You do need to pre-register for it in the program, just like any other session. Uh, and we can hold the discussion from there. So um, that's everything I have. Michael, unless you had any other topics that you wanted to hit on, we could do a question and answer from the membership. Sure. Feel free to chime in or post a question in the chat box. Either way works. I'll just chip in, it's Jim Stoner. Um, first of all, this conference has been amazing. I just absolutely shocked at how, what a great job you all have done. I'm going to ask an, two obvious questions. Uh, the first one is, have you all thought about the possibility of if we can go to Pomona, also doing it simultaneously um, virtual? And, and the second question is, um, I'm sure there were very good reasons why we're conflicting with EAM, but when I was on the board, we were very careful never to let that happen. And can, can we avoid that happening again next year? When I was active, most active, there was a lot of overlap between EAM and um, MOB, and OBTC, and uh, many of us went to both. And now this looks like next year we can't do that. Uh, can we avoid the ha that happening again? Let me take the Michael. Let me take the last second one first. Um, and I'm not going to pull my punches on EAM. Um, so for anybody who doesn't know, I ran EAM's conference since 2015, and I departed them. I walked away from them last year following the conference in Delaware uh, for a multitude of reasons. Um, but when I have run conferences or even just assisted, provided guidance, consultation with other conferences, one of the things that I always made a point of doing is keeping everybody in their lanes. And that is why EAM did not conflict with MOBTS and MOBTS did not conflict with EAM International and so on. Um, in this very first year away from EAM, that went to hell. Um, and I'm not happy about that. And I let them know, I let leadership know I'm not happy about that. Um, we declared our dates for this conference and for next year, months, oh, I'm sorry, for this year, we declared, declared it three weeks before EAM ever did. And we have already had this for 2021 on the books for over a year now. Um, yes, and, and Joan made a, made, made, a, made a good point. East, I still work with Eastern International, and I love them. Uh, and, we, and we do, you know, make it a point to, uh, 
to to stay out of each other's realm in that way too. Um, now, granted, Jim, if you're talking about Eastern International, Eastern International's dates are earlier next year in Lyon, France. Um, but Eastern Academy itself, the domestic conference, I don't have any say in. Um, all I can do, as I've told their leadership just a week ago, is please work with us better and check our dates, um, you know, better. Uh, th that's all I can say. I can't make them do it. Um, I did. I, I kept everybody in line for, for five years. Um, and, and that's that. So um, in terms of Michael, do you want to you want to talk about the prospects of hybrid conferences and things along those yeah, lines? I think it's a great question. It's one that we're still asking. <laughs> Honestly, Jim, I think it, everything's going to be on the table. Um, whether it be um, hosting it face to face as a traditional conference to a hybrid conference to a hybrid um, synchronous conference. Um, we just don't know the technology capacity um, or will we have to revert back to this or do we look at having a version of a virtual conference earlier in the year and then have a face to face um, uh, in, in June. I think what we're seeing, and the board will talk about this, but I think, as you stated, the experience has been um, unexpectedly positive and folks are getting more accustomed to using the technology. And um, I think some of our initial, our, I know my fears of this have, have gone away. So um, I think everything is on the table. That's a long answer to say, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I was in some sessions that were just as good as if I'd been there physically, I think. And I'm just thinking that you know people all over the world could come uh, virtually. Yes. And I know you thought about it a lot. I just hope you're able to pull it off that we can do both. Yeah, I think that's actually been um, for us the most positive aspect of it is that we left New Zealand with with so much energy and a number of the folks there were wanting, you know, we, the the deadline for for paper submissions for 20. Uh, 20 in June had already passed when we were in New Zealand and that so many of them, Oh, we want to come. We want to come. Um, of course the costs, you know, were, were, were difficult, but then once we shifted to virtual, it just opened up, opened up the door. And of course the costs were also quite, quite less. So yeah, no, this is definitely something we need to, to really consider. I think we, we've lost something, even though we've gained something with this online virtual conference, we've also lost, uh, some of it, uh, some of what, some of the tradition, some of the magic, it's not fully lost, obviously, as we'll see with Jim's place and the technology and these conversations and the, the talent show and everything. But yeah, we'll, we'll definitely look at what's, what's viable and, and keep everything on the table. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Jen has a question. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ray has a really comfy bed. Yes, the sheets are amazing this year. So Jen asked, what do, what do we return to in person? What elements of the conference make it benefit from being in person? Um, it's a good question. I mean, my initial answer would be the cultural experience. I, I think we've done a great job. I, th I think we have done as well a job as possible replicating that in a virtual format, but I still don't feel, think it feels the same. And to that extent, I, um, I do feel bad for some of our first timers because they have not had a chance to drink the proverbial Kool-Aid that we talk about. Um, this is, I think we've done a great job, but to all you newcomers, anybody who's in this room, um, you, you gotta come to a to an on-campus conference to really, to really understand us and feel us. Um, this is more of an appetizer, I think, uh, to what we can be. I think the, session, the sessions can be almost as good. It's the stuff around sessions. I think we still need to figure out for online to make them be as special to my mind. So that's my feeling is program share at least. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner in Jim's place in real and the sidebar conversations that just happen and the people who you get introduced to that you're not in a session with, but they come with somebody else. So it's all of those little network, social, um, fabric-y kinds of things that make MOBTS, I think, the special and unique experience that it is. The sessions are always great. 
you always come away with something you can use or an interesting conversation. Um, but it's that in between space that we don't experience online in quite the same way, I think. Yeah, we, we have a lot to, we have a lot to discuss and we really, in some cases, we don't have a tremendous, time, a tremendous amount of time to, to predict and project out what's going to happen because our call for papers opens up in four months. Um, but uh, I, I don't think there's any substitute for what we do um, on a, in a physical environment, like, like Jeannie said. Um, I, I don't get to attend that, you know, sessions like you guys do, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily even fit into what I do. But the, my fondest memories are those moments in between, like Jeannie was saying, and those late night discussions and the laughter and things like that. So, um, you know, not many conferences are built around that. And a lot of, in a lot of parts, that is who we are and that's how we get to be real. So um, a few other questions that came in. Um, Felicia Taylor asks, if, uh, do we have a demographic breakdown of our members? Uh, you know, we, we don't. We don't in terms of, uh, however, um, we are moving towards uh, being more aware of our demographics of, uh, you know, maybe the next stage of our reach, um, focusing in that area. Michael, this is probably, you know, something better for you to respond to since you've been a little bit more in depth in that than, than I have. Yeah, I, I've really been hoping that we can move toward our um, anytime we survey members or have our conference registration in particular to be able to gather that data. I think that'd be really helpful. Um, I, Brandon, we don't we don't have that on the conference registration. We don't have that on the the membership registration, right? We the don't. I mean, there. we happen to you know when we're doing dorm rooms and things like that. We, we ask things about gender and stuff, but we don't, we don't actively ask age. We don't ask, you know, race. We don't do those things now. I think it would be quite helpful. Yeah. And actually this brings up, I don't know that this will be a component of it. Maybe it will, but it is critically important for, uh, we will be sending out a post-conference survey about, about this virtual conference, please. And we have 285 attendees at this conference. Please fill out the survey for us. So, so we can, we have some feedback here. Felix asked a quick question, and will there be an organized trip to Disneyland next year for a conference outing? Yes. <laughs> Let's wait for that. It, it has been discussed. It actually, something along those lines in some capacity has been discussed. Did not promise anything. Can I say, having lived there and been to Disneyland more times than you would want to count, uh, please don't do that. Well, I'm not, I, I'm, I love Disney, but I'm not sure I want to go to COVID-19 Disney. Um, so how can you stay six feet apart with a mask on in Disney? I don't know. I need to eat my turkey leg. And it's hard to do that with a mask, honestly. Plus, there are some really cool things to do right around Cal Poly or even at Cal Poly. Because, you know, I lived at Claremont for five years or at, in Claremont for five years. So there's so many cool things to do. And Disneyland is not as close as you might think. Um, to Cal Poly, getting everybody down there and back alone would be, yeah, too much. <laughs> there have been a couple of questions in the chat about budget constraints and such. And look, we don't know. Um, I had made mention that we did ask that in the, in the survey. And a vast majority of people back in March and April had a feeling that there would be constraints, but did not know what those constraints would be. And even still, um, we're still a month and a half away for a lot of institutions, some longer, from the undergraduate class rolling in, and many schools do not yet know what the registrations are gonna be like. Um, there are some, just from the data I know, through BARB and stuff, you know, there are schools that are preparing for decreases of 10, 15, 20% of their undergraduate enrollment. And there are other schools I know of that actually have increased undergraduate enrollment during all this. It's a, you know, it's, it's crapshoot at this point. Uh, we don't know. We're, we're, we're basically um, just going to have to wait and see like everybody else. Anybody else? If I missed one along the way, just repost it, please. 
Um, I just like to say, given this is my first conference after 10 years of being, um, and you know, helping make decisions for 10 years, but not in the last year, I think you guys are doing a fabulous job. And you know, my generation really worked hard to turn this over to your generation, and I couldn't be prouder. I'm so happy with what's going on and all your new initiatives. I'm just, I just think it's fabulous. Thank you. Well, I haven't seen anything else come up. Um, thank you, Michael. Any any final words before we head on out? No. See you at Jim's place. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, another full day of sessions tomorrow. It's been wonderful. I hope you're not burnt out yet, or you can at least muster up enough, enough, enough energy to get out there for one more go. Um, but it's been tremendous. It really has been tremendous. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>